Ian, get over there and get these pages separated. We'll just work our way through the uh, through the blanks here. Paul says that I am what debtor, both to who and who. The Greeks and barbarians, both to the wise and to the unwise. So as much as is in me, I am ready to preach the to you who are at Rome also. Interesting uh, terminology in, in this particular text. Um, it's difficult for us to know exactly who Paul has in mind when he speaks of Greeks and barbarians the best uh, the best estimate or idea, I think the best conclusion uh, that can be drawn is that Paul is making a distinction here between the Greek-speaking world and the rest of the world. Uh, that, the, the, you know, that the Greek language was, was the language of the, of the entire world, of, of, for lack of a better, of, of the civilized world. In other words, all your major... All your major uh, population uh, centers would would all be Greek speaking people. Now, not only Greek speaking people, but they would be Greek speaking people. And but then you have the, the more remote areas where people didn't speak anything but their local dialect, and so those would be the barbarians. And Paul used this term on other occasions. Uh, in fact, when he was shipwrecked at Malta, he referred to those people as barbarians. Uh, he said, the barbarians showed us no little kindness. In other words, they were very uh, effuse in their, in their kindness uh, toward us. And so uh, uh, the nearest thing that I can relate that to is uh, uh, when we go, like when we, I, I say when we go, I haven't been in seven years, but you know, when we would go to Ghana, you could go anywhere, you could go anywhere in Accra, which is the capital city. At that time, had about 4 million people. Or you could go anywhere in Tagarati, which had about 750,000 people. You go anywhere in any of those cities and speak English. A lot of people don't realize that English is the official language of Ghana. <laughs> it's not even the official language of the United States, but it's the official <laughs> language of Ghana. You can go anywhere and speak English. Same thing in Kenya, major metropolitan areas. You go to Nairobi anywhere and pretty much speak English. You get out into the sticks and you're going to find people that do not speak English. They're only going to speak the local dialect. In fact, when we were in Kenya, we were so far out that a lot of the people didn't even speak Swahili, which is the official language of Kenya. So we would preach in English... Somebody would translate into Swahili, and we had one guy there who understood, didn't understand English, but he did understand Swahili, and he also understood the local language. And so everything we preached, got trans every word got translated twice. I'd say it, or, or Bill would say it, then this guy would say it in Swahili, and then the next guy would say it in the local dialect. You know, in this case, those people were barbarians. They didn't even speak their own language or the language of their own nation. And I think that's what Paul's talking about here. He's talking about the different types of Gentiles, the, for lack of a better term, the cultured and the uncultured. So I'm debtor to both, uh, both to Greeks, barbarians. Wise and unwise, again, may, may be a form of parallelism where he's talking about uh, people that know their way around and people that don't. In other words, people that are wise in the ways of the world. And I don't mean that negative way. I just mean people that know what's going on in the world and people who do not. The wise and the unwise. And so then he says, uh, and as much as King... I, 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 I like the way the King James... As much as in me is. I just love that, that phraseology. But the way we would say it, as much as is in me. Paul says, I am ready to preach the gospel to you who are at Rome also. And so I looked at this phrase, I am debtor to preach the gospel to those who are at Rome. And the, the, the way the, the sentence is constructed 
is not that Paul is a debtor to somebody else. He's a debtor to the people in Rome. He, he describes himself as a debtor to the people in Rome. And uh, Jack Cottrell has an outstanding commentary on, on the book of Romans, and I highly recommend it. Um, a buddy of mine in Texas, Bruce Ligon, uh, said he found it on eBay for $7.50, and it had the CD, the, the bonus CD material which was a really good deal because I think I gave about 30 bucks for mine. But you can, you can get a copy of this because I'm probably going to stay really close in Cottrell's material as we go through this. So if, if you're interested, it's called the NIV Commentary on the Book of Romans by Jack Cottrell. But uh, Cottrell says, here, here's how he explains that Paul was a debtor to the Romans. He says, a wealthy man dies and bequeaths his estate to a distant relative. His lawyer, the wealthy man's lawyer, is entrusted with the task of tracking down this relative and transferring the estate to him. In a very, and I'm by, this is a direct quotation from Cottrell's, I give it, it's in quotes and, and cited. In a very, or in a real sense, the lawyer owes it to the relative to make sure that he receives the inheritance. And that's, and that's how. Paul, that's how he describes Paul's debt to the Romans. In other words, he was a debtor to God. Obviously, we're all debtors to God. But Paul spoke of being in debt, in debt to the people that God was trying to get the gospel to. In the same way that this wealth, in this example, the same way that this wealthy man was trying to transfer his estate to a relative, God is trying to transfer his wealth, the gospel, to the rest of the world. And Paul says, I'm, I'm, you know, Paul's like, I'm the lawyer in the middle of this. You know, I'm, I'm debtor to take what God has given me and give it to these people. I owe it to them. Uh, I'm reminded of when, uh, and I know Rhonda won't remember either, but when we were in Prescott, uh, there was, uh, I'll say there was, there were a number of young men, at least at least three guys in our college group. We had there's a there's a small university. Uh, Phillips probably heard of it's Embry Riddle Aeronautical University, uh, and uh, there's one in Florida and there's one in Prescott, Arizona. It's a really exclusive engineering university, and there were three guys in our college group that were all converted by another guy that had just graduated. And Rhonda and I never did never did meet him. We never laid eyes on him, didn't know him in anything but by name and reputation. And we were always trying to get these three guys. It was uh, Matt and Pete and Vince. I know Ron remembers all of them because they practically lived with us for two years. That, you know, what do you, and, and I don't know, I can't, I can't even remember the guy's name that helped, that, that converted him. So I'll just, I'll just call him, I'll just call him John, all right? So, you know, every one of them were c converted by John. Said now what you know you know what do you owe in other words what do you owe John? Well, I owe him you know they, they'd tell you well I owe him everything. You know you know had it not been for him you know I wouldn't know the gospel I wouldn't have known to obey the gospel I wouldn't I wouldn't be a Christian if it wasn't for him. And then I would always follow up with the question then how are you ever going to repay John? And the answer was always the same. To do for somebody else what John had done for me. They were debtor. They were, de they were debtor not only to John, but they were debtor to the people who were in the same condition as they were before John found them. And so Paul says, I'm debtor, but I'm ready to preach the gospel to you who are at Rome also. And then note this with regard to the gospel. And this is something... Look, I. Being in full-time ministry now for over 30 years, you know, I hear and a, a lot of things that none of you will ever hear. You know, a lot of things, trends in the church, trends about doctrines and words and things of that nature. And, uh, and there, uh, in years past, and even I know some people now that I think are really confused about this, they think that the gospel is nothing but the death, burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. You know, now, of course, 1 Corinthians 15 
You know, it says, you know, moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached to you, which you also received, and wherein you stand, and by which you are saved, if you keep in memory that which I have preached to you, unless you have believed in vain. For I delivered to you, first of all, that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins, according to the Scriptures, and that He was buried and raised the third day, also according to to the scriptures. So Paul in 1 Corinthians 15 describes the gospel as the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus. And that is the gospel. But it's not all of the gospel. Now it's, the word gospel is, is like a like a hundred other Bible words. You know, usage determines meaning. And just because gospel would, would just because gospel it means the death, burial, and resurrection here. It doesn't mean that the word gospel means that in another place. For example, the Bible says uh, that uh, God preached the gospel to Abraham. But he defines that by saying, In you shall all nations of the earth be blessed. So by extension we know that God was talking about Christ. But do you think that God preached the death and the burial and the resurrection of Jesus Christ to Abraham when He preached the gospel to him? Or did He just tell him the good news that through Him all nations of the earth would be blessed? See, it, Because He told him that in Genesis 12 and Isaac wasn't born for another 25 years. And so we, we, you know, we understand that God's not talking about... And by the way, this is, it's a New Testament text where it says that God preached the gospel before to Abraham. Doesn't mean he preached the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ because the word gospel just simply means good news. So in this case, it means one thing. By extension, it means what 1 Corinthians 15. But then later in Romans chapter 2, Paul says, God's going to judge the secrets of the hearts of men according to my gospel. So we're going to be judged by the gospel, right? Does that mean we're only going to be judged based on the fact of the Death, burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ? Or is there more to it than that? And then you think about, go and preach the gospel to the whole world. Every creature, Mark 16 and verse 15. Go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He who believes and is baptized shall be saved. So obviously there has to be a response to the gospel. And if there has to be a response to the gospel, there has to be commands associated with the gospel. I mean, you can't obey the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ because those are facts. You can't obey facts. You have to obey commands. And so we have to obey, and by the way, the, the phrase obey the gospel is found in Romans 10, 16. It's found in 1 Peter chapter 4. Um, I believe it's in about verse 15. Uh, so you know, uh, 2 Thessalonians 1, 6-9, obey the gospel is found at least three times. That phrase, obey the gospel. So we know that the gospel has to be more than just the facts of the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus because those, there's, a, there's a response, there's an obedience that's attached to the preaching of the gospel. And so when Paul says, I'm ready to preach the gospel to you who are at Rome also, well, those people had already been taught the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus, right? Right? I mean, they're Christians, right? So if they're Christians, they've already been taught the basic facts about Jesus and they've already responded properly to, the, to that teaching. But Paul says, there's more, there's more that I want to teach to you. And Paul says, whatever it is that I'm teaching to you qualifies to be called the gospel. And so Paul, when Paul says, I'm ready to preach the gospel to you who are at Rome also, he's speaking directly to those Christians who had already obeyed the gospel. But again, more of what they needed to hear could also be classified, if we may use that terminology, as the gospel. And so Paul, and so, and, and I just say that, and one reason I say that is because it's been very, very recently that I've had to deal with this particular issue about somebody who just insists that the gospel is the death, burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And if you don't mention that, you've not preached the gospel. You know, if you don't mention the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, you've not preached the gospel. I don't agree with that. I, don't, you know, I can preach the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus, and that's part of the gospel. It's the heart of the gospel. But it's not all the gospel. 
And so, you know, sometimes these things kind of weigh on me as I, as I, as I, as I prepare uh, this uh, 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 material. Uh, lastly, in the last paragraph, um, evangelizing includes teaching, baptizing, and teaching some more. Now, Matthew 28, you know, uh, 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 verse 18, all authority has been given to me in heaven and earth. Go therefore and teach all nations or make disciples of all nations, as depending on what rendering, what translation you want to look at. But to teach and to make disciples is the same thing. You make disciples by teaching them and you make disciples by baptizing them. So go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. All right? Well, of course, Mark's account in Mark 16 is go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He who believes and is baptized shall be saved. Mark doesn't, Mark doesn't mention specifically about further teaching, but we know that's obviously the case. I'll give you another example. In Galatians chapter 5 and verse number, I believe it's in verse 7. Let me, and I'm going to look this up because I'm just pulling this and out, out of the deep recesses of my head. And that's a dangerous thing. Paul talks about in uh, verse number 7 of Galatians 5, he says, you ran well, who hindered you from obeying the truth? Hindered you from obeying the truth. Well, they had already obeyed the truth. They, they were Christians. But then Paul goes on to say, something has hindered you from obeying the truth. In other words, continuing to obey the truth. And I think it's perfectly legitimate to say, we are taught the gospel, we respond to the gospel, and then we continue to, to live in accordance with the gospel. All right. Um, any questions about that or comments before I move on to verse 16? KD, you got anything? All right. Question 5, right out of verse 16. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God to salvation for... Everyone who believes to the blank Jew first and also for the, the Greek. Now, in this case, I think Paul's using the term Greek in a more general fashion than he did earlier. Because he certain What's that, Kyle? Anybody that's not a Jew. Because obviously barbarians, if he's a debtor to preach to the barbarians, he's a debtor... He's a, and, and, and the word there may, I think there's some renderings that if you, if you got, got a Bible on your phone or another rendering, you, you might find that the word Gentile might be found in that verse instead of the word, uh, instead of the word uh, Greek. But obviously we know that the gospel is available for everybody, both Jew and Gentile or Jew and Greek. And if you were using the word Greek, it would also include the barbarians because Paul said he was debtor to preach to the barbarians. And so the word, uh, the word obviously includes everybody, all right? Now, it, it, it's strange, and I, I just made a note here. It's unclear why Paul would open this statement by declaring his unashamed embrace of the gospel of Christ. However, this theme is not uncommon in the New Testament with regard to the idea of our, our attitude toward the gospel. Paul said, I'm not ashamed of the gospel. Well, we can find other passages, and I mentioned, and the first one that came to my mind was Mark chapter 8, where Jesus said, Whoever is ashamed of me and my word, or words, in the midst of this adulterous and sinful generation, of him will the Son of Man be ashamed when he comes in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. So Jesus had already warned us ahead of time not to be ashamed of him or his words. No, no, those things are they're connected. We can't be ashamed of Jesus, and we can't be ashamed of His words. In other words, the, the, the not being ashamed applies just as much to His words as it does to Him. Because they're joined by me and my words. 
You know, and so you know, we might we might profess that. Well, I'm gonna get ahead of myself. I don't do this. Let me let's keep moving with the with the shame section. Then we'll get to what I almost jumped to, which is at the top of the next page. But Second uh, Timothy one and verse eight, Paul says, "Do not be ashamed." What? Of the what? Testimony. testimony. What's that? What's testimony? What's he talking about? The testimony of our what? Lord. Lord. That means the testimony that Jesus gave and the testimony about Jesus. It's both. It's not either or, it's both and. We can't be ashamed of what Jesus said and we can't be ashamed of what the Bible says about Jesus. Then it says, he says, nor of me his prisoner, but share with me in the... What? Sufferings or afflictions. All right. Yeah. Yeah. If you don't use the version I'm using, it's not in my head. <laughs> but that's fine. Affliction, sufferings. The sufferings for the gospel according to the power of God. And then note, Jesus' qualification of this shame as being amidst a sinful and adulterous generation. Many are reluctant to affirm the teaching of Jesus amidst unbelievers. And, and I use this terminology intensely, especially religious infidels. Well, infidel means an unbeliever. And generally the term infidel is applied to a person who doesn't believe in God. But the Bible also uses the term unbeliever as anybody who's not obeyed the gospel. Whether, whether or not they mentally assent to the existence of God, whether or not they assent to the deity of Jesus, whether or not they assent to the belief that Jesus lived a perfect, born of a virgin, lived a sinless life, died on the cross, buried, raised the third day, ascended into heaven, and come back. Whether or not they believe in that does not release them from being an infidel. Because the Bible speaks about anybody who's not obeyed the gospel is an unbeliever. It's not right it's not right to refer to any, well, we'll just say, any unscript, any unbaptized individual. And when I say unbaptized, I mean scripturally baptized. You know, a person has to obey the gospel in order to be called a believer. That's the way the Bible, that's the way the Bible uses the terminology. You know, when it speaks about believers, it's talking about people who have been baptized in response to the teaching of the gospel of Christ. So if they're unbelievers, they're also infidels, if you're going to use the term in its pure sense. And so I use the term religious infidels to refer to people who are uh, in religious error, some form of, some form of denominationalism, some form of... of, 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 of Christian belief, but it's not a Christian belief that adheres to the teaching of the New Testament. Alright? And so, and that's when, and by the way, that's when, again, my experience, doesn't say, this is, doesn't mean this is absolutely true, but it seems like that we are less inclined to teach what the Bible says around religious unbelievers than we are atheistic unbelievers. Because we don't want to offend a religious unbeliever to imply to them that in any way might imply that we don't think they're saved. But we wouldn't have any problem telling an atheistic unbeliever that they weren't saved, right? I mean, would, you know, would anybody dare tell a person that said they didn't believe in God and lead them to believe they thought they were saved? Why well, no? You know, but how many times? But how many times do we fail to defend what the Bible teaches amidst religious unbelievers, out of fear that we're going to offend them, hurt their feelings, make them have them to be mad at us? But Jesus said, "Whoever is ashamed of what? Me and my words. Me and my words. In the midst of a sinful and adulterous generation. By the way." Adulterous generation doesn't carries with it the idea of being joined to someone else other than Christ, right? 
I mean, any any time any time we have allegiance to anyone or anything, church or doctrine, that is not found in the pages of the New Testament, we that, that's to commit religious adultery, right? Is it not also sinful to do those things? And so it's not only when we think about a sinful and adulterous generation doesn't just mean all the, the most gross, vile infidels in the world. It means everybody that's involved in some type of sin or adultery. Whether it be physical adultery or religious adultery. And so it's, it's, you know, it's an imperative for us to stand up for Christ and to stand up for His words. Alright, top, top of the next page. Letter C. Yeah. How might we be ashamed of the gospel today? In what situations could we find ourselves that might cause us to be less than righteous in our attitude toward the gospel? What might be an example of that? Say it, Kyle. All right, in a situation where you have a lot to lose. Family, yeah, that's what I was thinking. Family and friends is probably the one that hits closest to home. What you know? What about you know if you're, you know, if you work in some type of environment and you're sitting at a break room table, you know, and the discussion turns toward religion, you know, and some and some piece of religious inf- misinformation is put forth. You know, what's the responsibility of the Christian? Try and correct it. At, at, at least to say, you know, well, and, and by the way, it, it doesn't have to start with, you know, that's wrong, right? <laughs> you know, that, that's not how you have to start. You can start with, well, how does that, you know, how does that, how does that fit in with, well, for example, somebody said, well, you know, uh, you know, we're going to have a baptism service in two weeks. Right, well, how does that fit in? You know, well, how does that fit in with the with what the New Testament teaches about baptism? You know, do we ever you know do we ever find anybody in the New Testament waiting to be baptized? You know, do, do they gather? You know, do they wait until they got enough people to make it worth the time and effort, or do we find in the New Testament that people were baptized immediately? In other words, you don't have to you know you, you don't have to bludgeon them. You just have to act, you just have to encourage them to think. How does you know how does that accord with that? You know how you know how did how do the, and as a general rule, here's what you're going to get. Well, that's the way you do things, and this is the way we do things. You know that's that's basically how it ends up getting resolved, right? You do things your way, and we do things our way. You know, I just said, look, I try to do things Bible way. You know, I had an opportunity at the, at the breakfast table a couple weeks ago to to, to do that very thing, and. Uh, we were talking, somebody, well, somebody at the table asked me what elders were. And he attends a denomination in town that doesn't have elders. And then the next question was, well, how are they different from deacons? You know, I told him the answer. You know, the elders are, you know, the qualifications for them are found in the first eight verses of 1 Timothy 3 and the first ten verses of Titus chapter 1. And, and, and those men have, you know, those men have authority in the local church. And deacons are different. They're servants. Their qualifications are different. Uh, you know, they're not the same thing. You know, and, and, and I said, it's pretty important. Because in Acts 14, they appointed elders in every church. And Philippians 1 was written to the elders and, or to the elders and to the deacons. You know, Paul told Titus to appoint elders in every church. And so, you know, I said, essentially having elders is the Bible way of being organized. And that was the end of the discussion. But the, the, the implication of the silence was, well, that's the way you do things, but we don't do, those, we don't do things that way. But at least, at least I got an opportunity to say, this is the way that, you know, and by the way, I, I, I never say that's the way we do it. I always say this is the way the Bible says it, or the Bible teaches it. This is the way the Bible teaches churches are to be organized. 
then, then they have to make their own decision. Do I want to do things the way I've always been doing them? Or do I want to do things the Bible way? Let me run off on a quick tangent here. Uh, a number of years ago, and I've got the copies of, of, the, of the transcript in the article. that and it's, it's still even available online. I think it's all the way back in about 97. Uh, there's a, a Baptist uh, scholar by the name of Mark Devers. D-E-V-E-R-S. Mark Devers. And he's pretty well known in Baptist circles. He's preacher, writer, lecturer, etc. And he was in, at the New Orleans uh, Theological Seminary which is a Baptist seminary. And he went down there to present the case for elders in the Baptist church. And by the way, if you do a search of Baptist church and elders, you will find that there are some Baptist churches that have elders. Now, they're pretty rare, but they do exist. But Devers went down, I'm talking about you know, in a theological seminary with a bunch of very influential people, and made the case, made the case for elders to lead the local congregations in Baptist churches. And here's what the response was. Here's what the response was. If we do that, we lose our distinctiveness as Baptists. They didn't say he was wrong. Yeah. They, they, did, they didn't say that what the man said was wrong or a misapplication of the Scriptures. They said, if, in essence, they said, if we do what you're saying, we won't be Baptists. And so they, re, they, rejected, they rejected His teaching, even though they admitted that He made the biblical case for His argument. But, but that was the exact phrase. We will lose our distinctiveness as Baptists. Which tells you what? What? Being a Baptist is more important than being biblical when it comes to church organization. I said, I'm not making this up. You can look it up online. You can do, you can do your own Google search. And it's, it's there. And I think it was 1997. Don't hold me to the date. But, but I, I, look, I even copied and pasted it into a, a document in case that website ever went down. I wanted, I wanted that information at my, at my fingertips forever. But that's what we're talking about here. That's what we're talking about here. You know, do, we want to be, you know, do we want to be biblical? Or do we want to be something else? And so... When we get opportunity to teach people, we don't teach them what we do. We don't teach them what we believe. We want to teach them what the Bible says. And so, uh, and, and in that sense, we don't, you know, we should never be ashamed, you know, of what of what the Bible says. Um, by the way, uh, just as a note here, um, said it is generally believed that Paul wrote this epistle during his time in Corinth, and there's some re references there. And the opposition to the gospel there was made evident in 1 Corinthians 1. And then Luke made reference to the opposition to the gospel in Acts 18 uh, when Paul was in Corinth. So uh, uh, Paul was conversant with all the things that might cause one to be less than courageous in preaching and defending the gospel. In other words, Paul got into a lot of trouble. He got into a lot of trouble in Corinth. I mean, they put some pressure on him. By the way, that wasn't the only time Paul <laughs> got in trouble. But I also thought about this at the last line. Paul himself pleaded with the church at Ephesus to pray for him. And this is a quote from Ephesians 6, 19. That I may open my mouth boldly to make known the mystery of the gospel. You know, who, would have ever, who would have ever thought that Paul would want people to pray for him that he would open his mouth boldly and preach the gospel. You know, if, if, if Paul believed that he needed prayers for people so that he would do and say what was right in boldness, then certainly it'd be good for us to pray for the same thing, right? To pray, to pray for boldness. You know, whenever, whenever we have opportunity to open our mouth and by the way, to speak boldly just means to speak in a, in a, in a way that, uh, that has, is confident. Because you know, if, if we speak what the Bible speaks, we speak with confidence. And, and we're not right because we're right. We're right 
because the Bible is right. By the way, um, just don't, and I'm going to stop here because I don't have time to jump too far into uh, uh, number six because it's another difficult text. Um, but uh, uh, Romans 1.16 you know, the text says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation. Uh, if I'm not mistaken, the definite article is not in that text. Literally, it says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel, for it is God's power. Now, they mean the same thing. But the point is, is that Paul says specifically, only the gospel contains God's power to save. In other words, no other message can save the souls of men other than the gospel. As, as Brother Warren said, uh, Thomas Warren said years ago and wrote a book on it, it says, the Bible only makes Christians only and the only Christians. In other words, the only thing that can make a Christian is the Bible. And the only thing that the Bible can make is Christians. And I think that's a pretty, pretty accurate statement, and one that you know that we would bear, that we would bear uh, uh, remembering. That any other message other than the gospel will not make Christians. There's no other source other than the Bible to make Christians, and it doesn't make anything but Christians. It can't make it can't make anything else other uh, than uh, other than Christians. All right. Next time, question six. And we'll do at least questions six and seven. Listen, I believe I could spend about half a year writing this one chapter. There's just so, man, this, this thing is just so rich, so rich. But uh, we'll, we'll start there. We'll start there, Lord willing, next time. Make myself a